Well, it's great to have this terrific group of faculty and students and friends and colleagues from around the world here to celebrate the publication of K2 Catrack's new book, which is a monograph on the wonderful choreographer Jay Potter, who we were very happy to host here at UCI a few years ago for a symposium in our global Shakespeare series. And I'm also really just touched that I've been able to read this book in manuscript form and to be in dialogue with K2 about her amazing project over the past few years and to have that friendship culminate now in this event. So I'm gonna be turning it over to K2 who will be talking about the book. And then we have a wonderful program ahead for you which includes a conversation between K2 and Jay, some video clips, and some commentary by artists and curators who have been influenced by Jay in their lives. Thank you so much, K2. Hello, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, Julia and Illuminations for hosting this book launch event. My thanks also to Deborah Nielsen and to Will Alvarez for their help. My book, J. Pather, Performance and Spatial Politics in South Africa, published by Indiana University Press, is the first full-length monograph on J. Pather, a world-class artist who is, as Julia said, with us today. Pather, a South African of Indian descent, is an award-winning choreographer, theater director, and curator whose stunning creative works deploy art to inspire social justice. Currently, he is Professor of Theater, Dance and Performance Studies at the University of Cape Town, Director of the Institute of Creative Arts and Artistic Director of the Siwela Sonke Dance Theater Company since 1997. Siwela Sonke's original mission of training youth continues today. This is at their studio in Durban. The seeds of this monograph were planted in my consciousness in 2012 when I discovered Jay's innovative choreography while doing research on the web. What I witnessed was original and provocative, like much of Jay's dance making. A silhouette of a foot, a human eye, a spinal column, startling images of body parts projected on the backdrop and the floor in his landmark work, Body of Evidence. My web-based inspiration began a seven-year journey of research visits to South Africa, interviewing Pather, other scholars, journalists, and imbibing the socio-cultural ambiance of this country, both beautiful and carrying apartheid's haunting legacy. As a politically progressive artist, Pather, throughout his 40-plus year career, challenges apartheid and post-apartheid's lingering traumas physical, emotional, and psychic. My book analyzes spatial politics in Pather's work based on the conjuncture of race and space in South Africa. Under apartheid, racial groups forcibly separated into different spaces prohibited black people from living in city centers and suburbs. Pather situates his choreography with black and diverse dancers precisely in those forbidden spots. As curator of ICA Live Art Festival and Infecting the City Public Arts Festival, he provocatively inserts art in Cape Town's CBD, the Central Business District. Bather's works exploring race and space are rooted in his society and inspired also by classics such as Mazizi Kunene's epic Emperor Shaka the Great, the Indian epic The Mahabharata, Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, The Tempest, and the Greek tragedy, the Oresteia, and there might be some others. He recognizes that in his own words, quote, the enduring and epic qualities of traditional and classical vocabulary. From the 1980s to the present, Pather's site works recognize the human body as a repository of history and memory and evoke the resilience of the human spirit. My book discusses Pather's site-specific and site responsive choreography and curation that showcase his artistry in global trends that are inter and multidisciplinary, 
that cross borders between dance, visual art, and technology. Among my scholarly goals in this book is a desire to bring wide recognition to Pather's art, significant today in debates on cities, on space and body politics, on race, gender, sexuality, and on art's role in ameliorating society. His choreography that intervenes in social justice reaches beyond its locally situated resonance to serve as models for dance makers and performance curators in South Africa and globally, such as in Pathas choreography on racial and gender-based domestic and state violence in his works, Unclenching the Fist, Body of Evidence, Capella Caesar, that echo in his country and beyond. In 2019, the horror of rape and murder of a student, 19-year-old Yunene Miryana at the University of Cape Town sent shockwaves throughout the nation, echoing Black Lives Matter rallies across the US and elsewhere after George Floyd's murder. Yet despite such traumas and the COVID-related shuttering of performances, art continues to have a crucial role in repairing our humanity. Indeed, in Pather's evocative words, quote, art is an essential service for healing, for public health, and social responsibility. In closing, I'd like to acknowledge a dear friend who could not join us today, Adrian Sushil, a veteran South African journalist and dance writer, whose archival assistance was invaluable for my book. Sushil sent this endorsement, quote, Katrak's book not only reveals Jay Pather's creative practice and philosophies, but critically contextualizes his curatorial strategies and ingenious art making in a dynamic country on a turbulent continent at war with itself. End of quote. I turn now to Namusa Makubu, professor of art history and visual culture at the University of Cape Town, who has kindly agreed to moderate this program. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ketu. Uh, good evening, good morning. <laughs> so the first time I heard that uh, Ketu is writing a book about Jay's work, I was really thrilled. Um, I just thought to myself, yes, of course, what a timely book. It needed to be written. Um, over the years, Jay has pioneered the scholarship on transdisciplinary, social justice oriented life art um, and has foregrounded, and I, this is something that's really significant, is has foregrounded the work of many artists, scholars and curators. He's created the space for collaborative work, taking on many difficult conversations in what was a transitioning but disorienting country. And all this um, comes out beautifully in the book. Um, so the book maps the ways in which Jay's practice as a curator, choreographer, and artistic director has broadened how we think about the usage of public spaces and the contradictions and contestations therein. So I have a question to kickstart the brief conversation between Ketu and Jay, um, and it will be a, uh, you know, each one will get a question. Uh, so Ketu, uh, you know, there's something that comes up as you just mentioned in your presentation, but it also comes up in your book. Um, it's not just the notion of site specificity, but site responsivity, which in some ways is not just about responding to space, but to people as agents in the construction of space. Um, so I'm wondering if you could reflect um, on that uh, notion, um, because I think it sort of sets apart the way that we think uh, analytically about Jay's contribution. And for Jay, um, I wanted you to enjoy this question. So it's it's about I just we just want to know what it is that you've enjoyed the most about your work, having dealt with such difficult themes, um, and many of which challenge their audiences to be critical about their own situatedness like, across contested spaces. Um, so perhaps let's start with Ketu and then Jay. Okay, thank you so much, Numusa. That's a beautiful question. Um, you know, the site-specific work and the site-responsive, of course, they intersect in some ways. So the site-specific works that uh, Jay did very importantly, the cityscapes work across Durban, 
Uh, that was uh, somewhat new for South Africa when he did that. Um, and then that work traveled to Johannesburg and also part of it came to New York City. The site responsive work, I think it sort of focuses more on, as you say, also how people respond to a particular site. And uh, one good example is Jay's uh, work called The Beautiful Ones Must Be Born. And the title is taken from Aikwi Arma's text, The Beautiful Ones Are Not Yet Born. Uh, but the inspiration for Jay is They Must Be Born. This is in 2010. Um, and that work, he decides to set that work on Constitution Hill in Johannesburg, which is a site that is saturated with history. You know, it's a site for political prisoners, the women's uh, section. There's also now an exhibit on Gandhi in that same space, areas where prisoners were kept uh, in solitary confinement. And, you know, tourists come to that site to have um, tours of what went on. So Jay uses five different locations on that whole hill and, you know, has the audience move with the performers from one site to the next. So, in fact, they're sort of traveling and imbibing that history, remembering it or engaging with it in whatever way they want and, um, you know, getting very subtle and provocative images through the dances, through the props. Um, he has the then president on the um, exercise bike, you know, running in place in one of the vignettes. And, and below that, there are da uh, dancers like ballet dancers sipping Coca-Cola. And there's a video, you know, the layering technique is very key to Jay's work. There's a video of people lined up in townships, you know, for food or water. So, you know, all of that is kind of just presented to the audience, that whole history um, without being heavy handed at all. Um, so, and then he has other site responsive works that I have also written about in the book. Um, so I won't go on and on, but maybe give Jay a chance to respond too. I hope that's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Jay? Oh, uh, well, first of all, I just uh, want to say thank you so much. Uh, I, I want to thank Ketu, of course. But I, um, you know, just to also say and put it out there that it's not just the gratitude, but just the the idea that I think many artists work, uh, we, you know, we work alone in a, in a studio. You work and you you much of what one does is purely um you know um, uh, audacity uh that you could trust a certain a certain instinct that can that can continue and knowing that at points you are going to be left alone with it and sometimes you are going to be embraced for it and it's uh it's that taking that chance which i think prompts me to answer your question about liking it and that you know not not for one moment expecting it to to uh, develop into any kind of discourse um, at all but I think if there is uh, if there's something that I really found exceptionally rewarding is um, is the collaboration uh, is the engagement with with a range of other artists and of course, in my more personal choreography work, uh, very often, of course, I'm, I don't uh, uh, claim uh, choreographic credit for myself alone. Uh, I've always said the choreography is with myself and with the dancers, uh, because uh, I've, <laughs> after two years of telling people what to do, I, I, I stopped in the when I was 26 or something or 25, and and found that uh, a dialogue with the dancers was much more much more important and then I've taken that into the cu curation and you know uh, there was a slide of Mamela Nyamza's 19 born 76 rebels which Ketu showed which was a profoundly experimental work and we collaborated in the curation about where to place this and we placed this extremely dense conceptual work uh, in front of the Cape Town station into Strand Street, which is, which is populated by, by a whole bunch of regular people. And, 
And it was just incredible for, for me to work with an artist in that way, in the curation, to take that chance about bringing this work into publics, first of all, that may not necessarily experience it, but to, to share that, that, that trust and that dialogue for, for a moment. But I think ultimately, and to extend from that, my last word on it is as much as I love the collaboration, I also understand that a lot, a lot of this I, I, uh, is, a, is a kind of a loneliness as well and getting, getting, getting in touch with that because you, you're, you're in between so many different spaces. I mean, as a person of Indian descent, growing up in the black consciousness movement and taking on an identity that's black, I also understand that there are certain ambiguities and difficulties in that, especially in, in, in this time. Uh, so you're always on some kind of an edge. And as an artist, you're also in the, on that kind of an edge of yeah, what, you, what, what you are trusting as uh, something that will fly with audience. And then when it doesn't, you kind of deal with it. And there's just something about that that makes one feel really alive, that you are always on some thin line. And that's, that I, I must say is quite exciting. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Just one last thing, Ketu. I mean, I think it's really brilliant that Jay is bringing, uh, you know, is pointing out the collaborative work because I think something that's also making this event very exciting is, is actually thinking through how many people have have blossomed, you know, and working working with Jay. Um, what was the experience like meeting all of the people that he's mentored and worked with, and you know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you. That's, yeah, that's such an important question. I wanted to bring that into my script, but I was trying to contain <laughs> to the five minutes. Um, one in one of the slides uh, when the Sibela Sonke training is going on. You see a woman, I, Tombi Gasa, I think she's mentioned on the top. Um, so when Jay became the artistic director in 1997 of Siwela Sonke, by the way, Siwela Sonke translates from Isi Zulu as moving over to a new place altogether. So kind of going from the apartheid era into a post-independence era. Um, it started as a training program. And I think from then on, Jay has been uh, amazing in terms of how he shares with uh, people who come to the training. And these could be people without much dance training at all, you know, and they bring themselves and both Tombi doesn't dance so much now, but Tombi and Nelly, the two people who are in the original group, uh, are choreographers in their own right now. And when I first went to the Siwela Sonke studio in Durban, it's on this little side street, um, they welcomed me so much because I said, I'm writing about Jay. And they were like, oh my gosh, you know, he's our mentor and what can we show you and what can we do, you know? Um, and Tombi had given me all of her scrapbooks where she had carefully cut out the reviews of the work in the 1990s and pasted them on these colored pages. So, you know, she shared that with me, which was really very wonderful to see. And then I think even uh, in the curation, Jay has had the kind of perspicacity, you know, to identify artists who are emerging and giving them a chance. And then really sort of, as he said, collaborating and mentoring them in terms of realizing their vision and presenting it. So I think the mentoring part is, has been very important. And I think as we can see, Jay is extremely modest. He doesn't take much credit for you know, all of these various uh, activities that he, he performs really well. Um, so I think that for me, it was just eye-opening to see the kind of respect that he has you know, among people that he has worked with. Um, so I don't know if that sort of answers it a little bit. Brilliant. It's brilliant. And it actually helps us segue to the dance clip, which we'll see, um, which uh, features four generations of Siwela Sonke dance theatre. Um, so Jay first taught uh, Nelly Siwa Rushwalang, which you just mentioned, whom you've just mentioned, Ketu. Um, in 1996, um, and Sibusi Sokansa was her was was her student in 2004, 
And they now teach uh, Nokolo Roshwalang, who's a senior trainee, and Glenda Makobi, a junior trainee. So the work that you're about to see is about the passing of legacy, um, which started as a as cell phone videos when the dancers were confined to their homes and made work on their own. So under decreased restrictions and commissioned uh, and, uh, restrictions, it was commissioned by Julia Lipton um, and Illuminations, um, the Chancellor's Initiative on Arts and Culture. The dancers came briefly back to the studio and collaborated to present um, these two works. Um, so this will be the first one that you see, followed by that there'll be another dance clip. Um, of, so, so the first part deals with the relationship between the father and son, but the second part or part two is a lighter work which is about a young woman who um, confined in lockdown is inspired by um, light she receives um, through her elders, through legacy. So we can, we can start the dance clip. Yeah, 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 yeah
Thank you so much. That was that was amazing. I think um, one almost needs a moment to 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 take it in. Um, I've always found that uh, a lot of the work, you know, that happens around Jay is has this tenor and resonance, um, so that we're able to see the complexities of things that we, you know, that are sometimes so everyday. With that, I would like to uh, welcome our next two speakers, um, Kanyisi Lembongwa, who is a public intellectual and artist, and was also the chief curator of the inaugural Stellenbosch Triennale, and is the adjunct curator at the Novo Foundation, and also Professor Catherine Coles, I'm sorry, <laughs> Professor Catherine Cole, who is the Divisional Dean of uh, the Arts and Professor of Dance um, and English at the University of Washington. Uh, she is also the author um, of Performance and the Afterlives of Injustice, um, among other publications. Now, uh, can you see has prepared, has, I think you have a photograph, an image that you want to, to show and speak to. Um, but I wondered also if, in addition to that, you know, you might reflect um, on, on some of the approaches from uh, Jay's oeuvre that have been valuable to you. I mean, you've created and curated across different spaces. So I think when you, when you engage with that photograph, it would be interesting to hear you <laughs> say a little bit more about that. <laughs> you know, um, so I, I decided to talk about Jay in terms of how I've experienced him, like, the, the human in the work, you know, cause I feel like everyone is going to speak about the work is done, you know? Um, so it is not every day you are invited to share a few words about your curatorial crush, right? I mean, to speak about a legend in their presence and to say, darling, you know what? You have done an incredible job in paving the path for so many people in your lifetime. You deserve this moment. So bask in this glory. Um, so this picture that you see here um, is when I met Jay in 2007 at a Gibka workshop, a performance workshop. Uh, he walked in with so much command of the space, his body and his voice, such soft power and such a presence. He introduced himself and I remember thinking to myself, how poised, how elegant and how intriguing this human being is. And as the workshop developed, Jay ushered us into parts of ourselves, encouraged us to search through the vitrines of our bodies and mine whatever it is that we found there. And what was interesting for me is that back then I was a performing poet, but I was also working at an auctioneer company as a PA to the marketing director. And I was making good enough money, but I was so miserable. And it was such a harsh lesson to learn in your 20s that money won't make you happy. So I joined this workshop and there I was against this windowsill balancing an entire human being with one arm. And I felt the precarity of my dreams. So what Jay had done was to create this space to confront myself, my desires, my dreams and everything I was told I could never be because I was born into being black woman and township. And as Jay says in, in Body of Evidence, but the body instead stores relentlessly, file upon file, bottomless cabinets of memory, individual and collective. And it's this moment I realized that my body carried with it my agency and the agency of my ancestors and the indigenous knowledge that lives in my body. So this moment was a catalyst for my path as a curator, um, as a thinker, as an intellectual, as an academic. And I had many more encounters with Jay in various degrees that were crucial to me, but there are two that stand out for me. One, when I interned at Gibka seven years later after meeting him, and I felt that everything had come full circle. And there's an important question Jay asked me at that interview, he said to me, what do you want to learn and walk away with in this internship? And this was the first time someone had ever asked me this question. And I felt the care 
you know, the extension of a lifeline is less like, it's not just about you coming and sharing and doing the things we need you to do in this internship, but what do you want to learn? Such an important question, so, so simple, but so important to show the level of engagement Jay has with the people that encounter him. And the second one is when he became one of my supervisors for my MA, alongside you, Nomusa, assisting me to shape and ground my thoughts and feelings. Um, I mentioned these two moments because Jay has shared knowledge and experiences beyond measure and was very consistent in how he held space with so much consideration, so much sensitivity and critique. I am so honored, Jay, that my path crossed yours. I have learned so much from you about ethics, morals, balance, curatorial perspective, theorizing, consideration, sensitivity, critical inquiry, intersectionality in the work that we do. And because of what I have learned and, and what you've shared with me, my cur curatorial practice is based on curing and care. And that comes because of my encounter with you. Um, and you have played a significant role as a pioneer in public art, live art, and interdisciplinary practices. I salute you for being brave enough to do this work for decades. I will stay crushing on you and the way you do and choose to do things. Yeah, that's, that's Jay for me. That's, I mean, he's, I'm totally every day crushing on how he does things. I think if my five-year-old self were to be asked by my primary school teacher, what do you want to do when you grow up? Now I would turn around and be like, I want to do what Jay does. That's, that's who I want to be when I'm grown. <laughs> yeah. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Catherine, we move to you. So Catherine, yeah. I've been in thank, all of you. Thank you so much, <laughs> Namusa. Um, so, um, so yeah, I want to, you know, Sketch is dedicated an incredible chapter on the transitional and the in-between. Um, providing an analysis of transitional spaces in, in, in Jay's work. And I was wondering if you could reflect on some of Jay's work um, that's been meaningful in your work on transitional justice as an infinite process that's haunted by a past from which it seeks to depart. Um, but of course you might have prepared something. So I won't necessarily let that question be the only thing that you respond to. But yes, please go ahead. Great, thank you. Well, your question was prescient. It, it aligns beautifully with um, what I was thinking I would say in these few moments. Um, I traveled recently from Seattle to Los Angeles. This was an emergency elder care visit under these extraordinary pandemic circumstances. And so I had to do this trip by car, not by airplane. And it's a really long trip. One way the drive is over 11,000, 1100 miles and takes over 18 hours. And on this journey, you pass through so many different ecosystems and terrains, the desert, the forest, the coast, agrarian, urban, wet, dry. And there are two major mountain passes, one from Oregon to California, and then within California, another one called the Grapevine, where you pass from the Central Valley into the LA Basin. These mountain passes are particularly extraordinary, extended, and cinematic. And in the midst of the pass, you're never quite sure when you'll hit the crest and when a whole new expansive vista will open up and you'll suddenly be propelled into an entirely new ecology and landscape when you will have moved to a new place altogether. I've lived half my life in different places all up and down this coast. So this recent trip was an amazing and uncanny journey through space and time, unlike anything I could have experienced on an airplane. In reading Ketu Katrak's book, Jay Pother, Performance and Spatial Politics in South Africa, I felt a similar breathtaking amazement about the epic scope of the journey through space and time that this book narrates. The book covers so many decades of Jay's life and art making and so many different epochs of South African history. It's ever shifting and volatile political and cultural circumstances, it's landscape, it's many mountain passes. 
One of the, as South Africa's most prolific choreographers and curators, Jay Pother has long deserved a book length study. And I am so grateful. So many of us are grateful that Ketu Katrak has provided us just that, an evocative and richly detailed rendering of Pother's oeuvre, showing us how he stages the dance between dances. He asks, what kind of dance wells up between disparate and previously isolated and segregated communities, especially in the wake of apartheid and its toxic remains. His nuanced depiction of the complexity of intercultural encounters within South Africa has great relevance in South Africa and well beyond its borders. Pother has a distinctive, expansive, and unique body of work that has been gradually and accumulating and amplifying um, since the mid-1990s. His presence in the South African art scene includes so many choreographic works, and then, of course, his leadership of the ICA, as well as the National Arts Festival and his curation of Infecting the City and the Live Art Festival. As a curator, Pother is reliably prescient, often presenting works by artists not yet known, but soon to be widely celebrated, discussed, and debated. His own artistic Im input as well as, as his curatorial interventions are deeply engaged with South Africa's histories, legacies of injustice, segregation, racialization, as well as the country's aspirations for new dispensations, for a better, more equal, just, and democratic future. I see one of the main contributions of this book is to provide this comprehensive, detailed overview of Jay Pother's life work to date. And because that artistic work is so body-based rather than text-based, this is an especially urgent um, scholarly project um, that uh, and contribution that Ketu has provided us. Uh, Jay Pother is a shapeshifter. In some ways, his protean qualities as an artist and curator have divided our more moribund disciplinary boundaries in the academy. In this book, Ketu Katrak does a superb job of tracking the core thread of Pother's plot line, uh, regardless of whichever aesthetic form he is working in at any particular moment. Ketu, you have given us, uh, you have taken us on an epic road trip through Jay Pother's career so far. It, the prairies, the mountain passes, the canyons, the forests, and yet the trip is not over. Jay is still very much in the fullness of his curation of making art, of engaging contemporary issues and their fraught histories, of writing and theorizing and contributing to a better future that South Africa will become. Jay, I know you don't drive, but you still are on an epic journey and I suspect much of the road still lies ahead of you. I hope you have a big car because we all want to ride along and K2, we want you to be there every step of the way, documenting, dialogue, dialoguing and giving us words and deeper understanding of this important work. Thank you so much. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> I really couldn't agree more. Thank you so much. Um, to you, Catherine, and to you, Kanye. Um, that was such a beautiful, beautiful way to now move us into watching the next dance clip.
That was absolutely stunning. I think it's worth uh, taking the moment to thank um, Siwela Sonke, um, you know, Nele Swa, Sbusiso, and Chant, and Otolo. It's really brilliant, brilliant. And uh, hope that you go from strength to strength. Um, next, it gives me pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Mbongeni Mchali, who is a practicing multimedia artist and director based at the University of Cape Town, um, and Bob Majors of AfroVibes, uh, festival manager and board, board member of AfroVibes. Mbongeni, perhaps let's start with you. Um, I mean, considering that social justice is also key to your work, could you give us a reflection broadly in terms of the radical shifts towards social justice in the creative disciplines that, that's also reflected in, in, in Jay's work. Yeah, um, thank you for having me. Um, and thank you for that question, Kanye, um, oh, sorry, not Kanye Um Yeah, I mean, I, I had also prepared a short address where the, the question will be answered, but by way of introduction to that, um, as I'll kind of explain shortly, I think one of the key things that um, Jay has informed in me as both a scholar and practitioner of performance, um, and more recently as a colleague at UCT, where I've you know, had the privilege of working for the past five years, is exactly this, this decolonial impulse that, that kind of throbs underneath all of his work, whether that's in terms of how he's leveraging a kind of syncretic aesthetics, for want of a better word, um, that kind of collides Africa with, with um, the West or um, these kind of radical appropriations of public space that the book um, reflects on. Um, the, the work and, and the environment that Jay has, has invested in producing over many years is absolutely replete with that and, and, and feeds me daily and continues to feed me. Um, yeah, so as I said, you know, I, I feel very privileged to have been invited to participate in this event and to bear witness um, to this momentous occasion. It's momentous, obviously, for both Professor Kachak's timely publication, but also for the subject whose body of work the book recognizes and celebrates Professor Jay Pather. As Professor Cole and other speakers have already noticed, noted, this has been a long time coming. Um, my relationship with Jay and the impact that his work has had on my development as a practitioner and scholar of performance extends back much further than I think even he might be aware of. Um, it certainly long precedes the beginning of my tenure at the University of Cape Town, where we now work alongside one another. One of the earliest and most enduring memories that I have of Jay's work was an image I saw in a Sunday newspaper in what must have been my late teens. I'm not going to admit how long ago that was. Um, it was a photograph of a chorus of black performers painted a stark white, wearing clothing reminiscent of the colonial Victorian garb, arranged in a monumental staircase leading up to some civic building in some city that I cannot recall at present. It might have been the New York leg of cityscape something now. What I do remember is feeling a palpable sense of wonder and excitement at the hitherto unimagined possibilities for what performance could look like and be. Even experiencing it secondhand, filtered through the lens of whomever it was that took that image, I was transported by what seemed to me to be a beautiful and audacious feat. Black bodies taking up space unapologetically, laying claim to those very spaces that would otherwise insist on their rejection. In that arrested fragment of a live public event, I was given the permission to dream, to imagine performance otherwise, and in so doing, to envisage myself and the context, context that shape who I am in new, exciting, disruptive, and eminently generative ways. My own work in Christian investments, as I've pointed out, all these many years later are significantly indebted to that first encounter, that promissory glisser, gliss, glimmer and what it initiated. I say this to underline, as Professor Kachak does in the book being launched, I'm sure, that Jay has for many decades been a vital and ever present feature in the South African live and public art landscape. Even if out of an abundance of modesty, he might not be willing to admit this himself. Whether it is through his creative practice or in his role as curator of Infecting the City and various other festivals in Cape Town, Jay's invested an extraordinary amount of time and energy in creating spaces for practitioners whose work does not so easily sit within the environs and politics of the proscenium arch. His considerable personal investment has not only allowed these artists to develop their craft and engage meaningfully with the various quotidian publics upon whom their work reflects, but has also produced and sustained new audiences, even in the ever more precarious conditions that we find ourselves of late. So to say that Jay has acted as something of a midwife to groundbreaking breaking performance in South Africa is not, I think, an overstatement of the crucial role that has played in shaping contemporary performance culture for several generations of theater goers and practitioners, both here and beyond. 
nor is it an overstatement to say that because of this, he has been responsible for creating the fertile ground from which an extraordinary and varied body of performance scholarship has sprung. Whether working as a curator or practitioner or scholar or teacher of performance, it's his deep investment in performance as an ethic and a mode of critical address that continues to enliven and sustain those spaces, reminding us of the subversive world-making power of performance and of the serious, seriousness and import of our cultural labor. So thank you, Jay, for your capacious vision, for your generosity, and for showing us how to imagine ourselves and our collective spaces anew. I look forward to reading this volume, Professor Katrak, and to the many critical conversations that would undoubtedly spark. And congratulations to you both. Thank you. Thank you for that, Mbongeni. Bob, um, I think, you know, again, I think, you know, we're running out of time, but I think there's so much that's beautiful that's coming out about the book and, the, uh, and about Jay's work. Um, but maybe just very quickly, so much of what's insignificant about Jay's work uh, and artistic directorship is precisely the social engagement in physical space with its embedded histories. Now, Afro Vibes 2020, Bob, <laughs> um, you know, Jay addresses the notion of entanglement in a context of physical isolation and then having to work across physical and digital spaces. What are your reflections about um, you know, last year and, and what artists had to go through and the way that Jay approached it? Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I prepared also a, a little uh, a brief um, quote on, uh, on Jay. Um, Afrovibes is a performing arts festival that brings uh, contemporary performing artists from the African continent to Europe. Uh, this year we have our 18th edition and Jay is artistic director since 2016. Now, if I look at Jay as artistic director of the festival, and that was also the same as last year, uh, there are three things I would like to highlight, highlight. And the first one is that Jay brought in the artistic vision that, Afra, uh, that Africa um, is not a country. It's deconstructing the whole concept of Africa as a country. Um, he brought this into the programming of the festival as an artistic vision. The other one, uh, the second, is the intersection of tradition and modernity, or actually the tradition and the contemporary. And the third one is that discourse uh, can be and should be an important element of a festival's programming, especially a festival like this one. Now, last year, uh, the theme of the festival was entanglement, and it was a very special one because um, the thing was that actually the whole world was entangled in this pandemic, in this crisis. Uh, and all together, together with Jay and the team here in the Netherlands, we managed to have a festival, including artists traveling from the African continent and elsewhere to Europe uh, to the festival. Unfortunately, not everybody could travel, but we managed to have a number of people here. And um, the festival did, with the theme, it did exactly what uh, it uh, should be and is supposed to be. Connect people. It connects people across cultural barriers. Um, now, if I look at um, the, the vision Jay has for the festival, his point is, and um, that, for instance, that um, the Nigerian author, um, Chimadanda Aditya, she spoke on the dangers of a single story, the dangers of a single story, the idea that an entire culture can be summed up in one narrative, in one story. Um, and this underlines uh, Jay's vision, the artistic vision uh, he set out for the festival. Uh, what are the narratives in Africa and how can we ensure that the breadth and the length of the whole continent will be included in a program program uh, which brings performing artists, contemporary performing artists from the continent to the Netherlands. Uh, for this, Jay drafted a vision in which uh, every year the festival will bring a separate edition, West, South, East and North, the Maghreb. Um, and within these uh, regions, uh, Jay will work with curators uh, who will, to divide to dive into the narratives and the contemporary artistic developments in those regions, Jay will work with regional curators who together with him will identify and highlight current artists and their work. And more specifically, that was last year, but it will also be the same for the upcoming years. Jay wants to look at the highly developed forms and initiatives and the impulses that come from the city, 
the city as a constantly recreating environment, which comes in, case, in some cases the most rapidly expanding in the world. And these impulses create and form new identities. Identities, they speak to tradition as well as the contemporary. And for this, the festival has three lines of programming, which Jay set out for us. That's the metropolis, encompassing work that represents the urban as a creative environment, a contemporary identity to encompass the intersection of the tradition and the contemporary and interior voices, to hear the voices of the individual artists, often solo works. This brings me to a second aspect of Jay's work, um, his <clears throat> artistic directorship. That's the intersection between the tradition and the contemporary. And that's what we exactly saw last year, and which we will also see the upcoming years. Um, we know that fusion of tradition and the contemporary, it's a common motive in Jay's work and in his artistic approach of the festival. He wants clearly to have this reflected in the program. In many of the works of contemporary artists in the continent, tradition and contemporary, or actually modernity, are not opposed but connected. There's an intersection between the two. What we can see is that tradition is the contemporary, defines someone's roots, the artist's roots, is parts of this. And this, the intersection between the tradition and the modernity, is one of the core elements in Jay's vision in programming the festival. The important issue is how traditions are represented. They can be uplifting, connecting the artist and also the audience with our roots, but it also becomes superficial and easy. This is a very delicate balance. And Jay is exactly the artistic director who keeps that balance between the two, between the easy and the entertainment, the, the tradition and the roots, the integrity of traditions and the connection between the tradition and the contemporary. In this sense, is this sense it's not the easy stuff that Jay brings to the festival. And that brings me to the, set, the third and the last point, and that's the importance of a discourse in a program. Now, last year, with the entanglement uh, theme, we brought into the festival a separate part, a new part. It was a number of panel sessions, panel discussions, <clears throat> partly online and partly in the theaters, in which performing artists and artistic practitioners from South Africa, from Nigeria, also from the UK and from, from the Netherlands, um, could connect and would connect, did connect with the audience and with themselves to talk about the work and the importance of their work. And this is a very important element that Jay has brought into the festival discourse. And this is especially important if people from different cultural contexts are looking at each other's work to understand. Because a festival and a programming is not only presenting work, but it's also understanding each other's work. In this sense, it's a two-way street. Um, so to conclude, the importance of Jay in, as an artistic director of this festival is to deconstruct the concept of Africa as a country, to say that Africa is not a country. It's the intersection of the tradition and the contemporary, and it's including the discourse in the program of a festival. Mm. Apart from all this, I must say, uh, as one of the organizers and also one of the co-founders of the festival a long time ago, um, Jay is a very warm person. And over the years, we worked together with Jay. Um, I learned a lot of him and also about the contemporary work in an African context and in the African continent. Mm. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much to all our speakers. I'd like to invite the audience to stay on a few uh, minutes to address um, any of the questions that you might have. And I'm going to um, hand over to Julia, who will moderate the last session for us. I hope many of you can stay on because I mean, this is, I think this is a topic that's very close to all our hearts. <laughs> but thank oh. you so much. And I'll hand, off to, hand over to Julia. Well, maybe I could have K2 and Jay stay on the screen. And I uh, just want to thank the panelists for an extraordinary homage to a great artist and a great scholar. 
and to say again how happy I am to have been part of this, to have met Jay a few years ago here at UCI. I hope we can bring you back in person <laughs> uh, in the next couple of years as well to see what else you're up to. Um, we're just going to take a couple of questions from the audience because we are past the hour, but we've collected such an amazing group of international speakers here that we didn't want to end prematurely. Um, so there's a lot of very positive commentary in the Q&A. Um, there's a question here uh, for Jay um, from, I'm so, sorry if I ruin your name, Bera Jose Schroff, asking about um, healing and elements of Nagoma healing intertwined in Jay's work. Um, and she, Bera Jose was also loved the ancient spirit figure in the dances that you shared. Just a couple of words about dance healing movement in your vision. And please unmute. Oh, you think you will be custom used to that by now. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you for uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you for to the panelists here, you know, uh, uh, to reiterate when one does these things, you you just go through it instinctively and um, uh, uh, to have it unpacked in that kind of way. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. It was really wonderful to hear. Um, the the uh, Mungoma is uh, is something, of course, that is uh, is, is just one of the forms that uh, Sewala Sankha has uh, has worked with, and we've worked over over the years. Um, the connection with the healing is definitely is is certainly there, and I um, I, I just do want to say though that the I've um, I do try to draw the line between the work as. <clears throat> Uh, as therapy, um, understanding that there is a possibility for developing an atmosphere where there would be some kind of healing, some kind of, hopefully, some kind of a release. I'm not, I'm not going to be blindsided about that, but I really, um, I, I make it quite clear with the dancers in terms of what we bring into the space uh, that that we we will. We will cross through um, spiritual, psychological, a whole range of other aspects of who we are in the rehearsal space. But ultimately, we are making a work of art. And um, how that work of art touches sides with, with healing is something that we can't stop in, in a place like South Africa. There's no way one can, one can cut that off. But, uh, but but to say that it's not a specific move, we don't go out with you know with a sense of you know we we would have to develop that as as healing. And I hope that answers your question because it's also that I'm also self conscious of my own limitations in that. And sometimes you know some, the dancer that you spoke about, Nelis for Rushalang, is profoundly spiritual, and she you know every move she makes, she we can't help but have a wellspring of of spirituality in the room. Um, but we 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 she under, also understands my own limitations in terms of my own background and it becomes a it becomes a conversation between us rather than you know just one thing or the other i hope that answers yes that's beautiful and then there's also a question here um about how you how you mentor new artists maybe maybe you could comment on that and then we will uh, let people move on. Thank you so much, Jay. Uh, can I just add something? Yes, please, please. Yes, I, I just wanted to uh, thank all of the people who spoke and who agreed to be part of this uh, whole process. I think it's a great tribute to Jay and I'm so happy that I've been able to write this book to honor his work and to get his work better known in the United States. So uh, some of the questions in the chat Jay already answered. The Fauzi Afzal Khan, who wrote about identity and Jay answered. Um, and then there's a question, um, well, Julia has asked the question about mentoring and maybe I'll just dovetail this other question. Um, Daphne Lay asks about if there could be an online companion to the book so that we could actually sort of include the works and be able to see them. You know, that's a different kind of tall order. But Jay, you could talk about the mentoring if you like. That's really a crucial part of you, what you do. Thank you. 
uh, well, I, you know, I, 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 <sighs> I just don't know where, where I would start except to, to say that I, I try as far as possible to, to, to hold space, um, to give space and to hold that space and to allow, uh, allow the artist to, um, to find to find a way to find their own way when there's a lot in in, a, in my choreography uh, my choreographic um, uh, beginnings are very uh, very much about asking questions they're more conceptual rather than saying you know do these these um, do these movements so there, there's a great deal of improvisation and a, and a sense of digging into oneself and going into oneself and then and finding and finding one's uh, one's movement, um, because I, I you know I remember when I trained as a dancer and I was to, uh, I had to perform uh, and being told so many different you know being told like specifically that these are the things that you can do and you know this arm means something or this leg means something else. I'm I, I'm quite I quite like the idea that uh, we're working with very fluid. Mercuric energies, which I try to 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 release, rather than to direct in a in a very specific way, and uh, you know, to 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 draw the dance out of the dancer, to allow the dance to emerge, rather than to take the dance and turn them into something that I I want them to be, um, and, and 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 very often it starts to become quite a quite an incredible complex. Uh, layering of consciousness and different um, and different ideas. Uh, my my work is often. I mean, let's face it. My work has also often been severely criticised for being way too dense and <laughs> way too uh, convoluted. And uh, uh, and uh, you know, that, uh, I think one 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 writer wrote, uh, you know, it'll take. A, a, you know, it's too intellectual and it's too uh, it's too layered and it's just too much going on. Um, and I think it's. Um, and I, I, I think my answer to that, because that was also quoted by um, a speaker in a panel, and I and they wanted me to address that. And I said, you know, if we think we know someone when we encounter them in real life, uh, where you know we can be sadly mistaken. And I think uh, I think that's the way I deal with my choreography. That there are going to be little bits and pieces that might stay with you, and there's going to be a lot you're going to miss. How much of this conversation has everybody heard? You know, we've, oh, there is so much going on. You can only you can only take in a, take in what you can, and and that's with your encounter with with, with someone. So I, I you know, so I really I I really believe that you that people bringing in this this different work or this, these different aspects to themselves and my allowing for that to to emerge and to happen. Is part of really trying to understand how complex um, our 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 interrelations are, and to and to and to allow that to to emerge. Because also knowing that time is also another thing that you don't, you may, we may not necessarily understand it at one point, but there will be another time when it will come to you, and something will drop, and hopefully, that image, that you know, use of a of a pulchard can in somebody's in somebody's cupboard in one of my works, which one of the dancers brought, and I decided to work with it. Um, that will make some sense, and yeah, that's all I can say. <laughs> beautiful, so beautiful. So mentoring is a kind of dance, and dance is a kind of mentoring. <laughs> so I just love it. So again, the book is wonderful. Uh, you can use the code Pater at Indiana University Press to get 30% off. Um, we will be posting this event on the Illuminations YouTube channel and sharing sharing the dances with Jay's permission. So um, this was just a feast and a celebration, something that we all need right now is our sense of, of the role of the arts in cross-cultural communication in, in education and healing and in the advancing of thought, which I really see happening in this extraordinary body of work. So um, my thanks to everyone who, who, who came from all over the world um, to participate in this glorious celebration of Jay Potter as 
monographed by K2 Catrack. Thank and you. I just want to add my thanks to Julia for you know, taking up this idea and really helping through the entire process of putting it together. So thank you, Julia, you're such a mover and shaker. I also wanted to ask, Will, if we could save the Q&A, you know, before we sign off, because there are many, many comments and wonderful questions that have been posed there. And maybe, you know, we could address them to individuals. We know a lot of them, some from the US, some from South Africa, who've written in somebody from Germany and so on. So that's up to Will. If we can. We'll try to do that. Yes. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Julia. Okay. Bye, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your days and your evenings. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Thank you.